We're at Nash's Dinosaur Track Quarry in South Hadley, Massachusetts. It's located about one and a half miles in that direction from where the very first dinosaur track was discovered in 1802. And we're asking the question, we have a series of dinosaur tracks here where a dinosaur walked right in this very spot, but did he walk here 100 million years ago or about 4,500 years ago, about the time of Noah's flood? How old do you think the Earth is? How old is the Earth? Oh, uh, about, I don't know, four and a half billion years old, okay. probably. Why, why do you say that? Why that old? Well, because that's what science says. Uh, science dates it back to four and a half billion years. Uh, a hundred billion. Why, why that old? I think I remember that in my science book. And scientists have actually been really researching this. And you, it's, it really can't be more than about 15,000 years old, scientifically speaking. How old do I think the Earth is? Between 6,000 and 10,000 years old. Okay. Why do you say that? It's just this seems to be the bib biblical account, generally within those numbers. Wow, that's quite a variety of opinions. Well, how old do you think the Earth is? The Earth is either billions of years old, or it's a few thousand years old. There really are no other possibilities. Those who believe in evolution say the Earth must be billions of years old to allow enough time for evolution to happen. On the other hand, based on the Bible, the Earth is only a few thousand years old. How old do you think the Earth is? I think it's approximately 6,000 years old. Okay, and why? What's the reason, do you think? Because I believe that you can count that back in the Bible. It's biblically provable. The Earth's about 6,000 years old. And why do you say that? Well, if you look at Scripture and uh, you actually add up the years, um, it points to a young Earth. And so it uh, comes out to about 6,000 years if you look at uh, what the Bible says. How old do you think the Earth is? It's, it's near 6,000 years old. I say near because I've heard from people that it's like 7,000, 6,000. But if you add everything up in the Bible, then it's like near to 6,000. The words, the earth is 6,000 years old, are not in the Bible. But the Bible does say the earth is about 6,000 years old. How does that work? Well, we can see how it works by looking at a baseball box score. Here we have the results of a playoff game between the Los Angeles Angels and the Boston Red Sox. Who won the game? Well, as you can see, the final score is not given. All we have is the number of runs scored by each player. Ellsbury scored one run for Boston. Four players each scored a run for Los Angeles. So what was the final score? Well, it's obvious. Los Angeles won by a score of four to one. All you need to do is add up the runs. It's the same with the Bible. All you need to do is add up the years to get the age of the Earth. How old do you think the Earth is? Uh, I think the Earth is about um, 6,000 years old. And why do you say that? Because um, when you add up all the family records in the book of Genesis and throughout the Bible, and you add them up and you take it literally and plainly, the number comes out to be around 6,000 years. So I believe the Bible is true. Starting with Adam, the Bible provides a continuous series of birth years that can be added up to give us the age of the earth. Let's take a look at a few. The Bible says Adam was created at the beginning on day six of creation. Genesis chapter five then tells us, when Adam had lived 130 years, his son, Seth was born. When Seth was 105 years old, his son Enosh was born. Now, how many years after the creation of Adam was that? 130 plus 105, that gives us 235 years. When Enosh was 90, his son Canaan was born. When Canaan was 70, then Mahalaleel was born. This puts us at 395 years after the world was created. One after another, the Bible gives us the birth year, allowing the years to be added up. 
There are no gaps. There's no room to insert additional people or years. And this genealogy from Genesis chapter 5 takes us up to the year of Noah's flood, 1,656 years after the creation of the world. The genealogies continue after Noah's flood until they bring us to the time of Abraham, a time for which other historical records are available. Based on the Bible, in the year 2010, the earth was 6,014 years old. That's why you hear people say that the Bible says the earth is about 6,000 years old. How old do you think the earth is? I think it's 6,000 years old because I believe that's in keeping with what Scripture teaches. Why do so many people say they believe the Bible? How old do you think the earth is? Well, the only way you'd know how old the earth is if you knew someone who was there who saw it when it started and then revealed to you uh, the chronology since that time. And I would say that the only one, of course, who has always been there is God. The only one who saw it started is God because he brought it into existence. And we have a book called the Bible which claims to be a record of God who has revealed to us what has happened. So when you take that record of six days of creation and taking those days as ordinary days, which the Hebrew word yom in the context of Genesis 1 with evening, morning number means, uh, then with all those begats in the Old Testament adding up all the dates, when you do that, you would come to about 6,000 odd years. Uh, certainly not millions of years or billions of years, but if you take that record as written and that chronology, it's just thousands of years, about 6,000 years. On television shows like CSI, what is the one thing they are always missing? A reliable eyewitness. When it comes to knowing what happened in the past, having a reliable eyewitness is the best way to get to the truth. And God is an eyewitness who was there when he created the earth and who has, in the Bible, told us how he did it and what happened. But what about all the scientific evidence? Has science proven God to be wrong or to be a liar? Or maybe the Bible's nothing but a collection of myth stories and science has shown us we truly did evolve from chimpanzees. Is the age of the earth billions of years or 6,000 years? Now that's quite a difference. We should be able to see that difference when we look at history and observe and measure the universe around us. One way we do this is to see whether scientific predictions about what we should observe match reality, or do the predictions based on the Bible match reality. Let's take a look at a simple example. And how old do you think the Earth is? I think it's a young Earth, like 6,000 years old. And why do you say that? Because of the small amount of dust that the astronauts and the astronauts landed on the moon. They thought they t had these big platforms for landing on it and they thought they were going to sink down into all this dust and they just had a little tiny amount of dust that shows young Earth. If the Earth was billions of years old, then the moon would have been exposed to UV and X-rays that would have destroyed the surface layers of exposed rock reducing them to dust and creating layers of dust that some scientists predicted in the 60s would be nearly a mile deep. On the other hand, if the Earth is only 6,000 years old, the Moon should have a thin layer of dust. What is reality? When Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin landed on the Moon, they found it had about three quarters of an inch of dust, just about the right amount for an age of 6,000 years. Let's look at another simple example, comets. Comets circle the sun, coming from the outer reaches of the solar system, swinging around close to the sun, and then heading back out again. As they get near the sun, they grow long tails. Now, comets are mostly made of water. They're kind of like a giant dirty snowball. As they get close to the sun, they heat up and pieces fall off, and that's what forms the tail. Each time the comet passes around the sun, some of the comet material is lost until eventually, the comet is gone. If the Earth is billions of years old, there should not be any comets left. They all should have fallen apart, evaporated, and disappeared by now. On the other hand, if the Earth is young, then comets have not had enough time to fall apart, and we should still be seeing comets. What is the reality? We still have comets. So the Earth must be young. But wait! I was taught in high school science that there is an Oort cloud 
far out beyond the edges of our solar system, and new comets are continually introduced from the Oort cloud, replacing those that are gone. Has anyone ever seen the Oort cloud? Well, no. Is there any physical evidence that an Oort cloud exists? Well, no. If you say there is no evidence for the existence of the Oort cloud, eventually somebody is going to come at you and say, sure there is, there's plenty of evidence. We know how big it is, we know where it is, and we know how objects are knocked out of the Oort cloud to become comets. Listen very carefully to the words they use when they describe and explain the Oort cloud. You'll hear words like, perhaps, maybe, it is thought, we believe, possibly. In other words, we don't know anything about the Oort cloud. It's all guesses based on the assumption that the Earth is billions of years old. But it's not billions of years old, it's just 6,000 years old. And that means there is no need for an imaginary unseen Oort cloud. Comets can easily last 6,000 years. The Oort cloud is what is known as a rescue device. A rescue device is used when what you want to believe does not fit the observed facts. It is used to explain something that otherwise makes no sense based on your belief system. We can always call on the unknown to rescue us, and trusting in the unknown, such as an Oort cloud that, as far as we know, does not exist, can explain away any lack of actual real evidence. Now, as I've talked about the Oort cloud, you've been seeing diagrams and drawings showing the Oort cloud. But keep in mind, these are all artist renditions. Yes, they are nice drawings, but they are just made up out of somebody's imagination. Nice drawings do not mean there's any truth in the drawings. Oh, and by the way, since the Oort cloud doesn't work, some astronomers claim comets come from a closer-in ring of material called the Kuiper Belt. Now, the Kuiper Belt does really exist. It is real, but it does not contain the right kind of materials that are found in comets. It's just another failed rescue device. If we look at the plain evidence of comets, that evidence matches up with the Earth being young. Now, is there any evidence that the Earth is billions of years old? What are the top three evidences that are given as supporting the Earth being billions of years old? Well, they are the use of radioactivity to date rocks. This is known as radio dating. The many fossils and many layers of sediment found around the world. And we see galaxies that are billions of light years away. That light had to have taken billions of years to get here. Oh, and by the way, Getting into the details of these subjects can involve significant scientific knowledge. In the time we have, we'll have to stick to just an overview, but if you're interested, you can go to our website to get books and links to more in-depth information. Now let's start by taking a look at radio dating, or as it's called, radiometric dating. Radio dating is a method of measuring the amount of radioactive materials and products in a rock and using those ratios to determine the age of the rock based on how long it takes for the radioactive material to decay. There are a wide range of different ratios that are used for dating. Some of the more popular ratios are uranium lead, thorium lead, rubidium strontium, potassium argon, and potassium changing into calcium. And within these, there are additional ratios that can be used, such as uranium-238 and lead-206, uranium-235 and lead-207, or uranium-232 and lead-208. There are many different radio dating methods. So, is dating using ratios of radioactive materials accurate? Well, there's a simple way to find out. Test them with rocks of known ages. This has been done many times with the same results. Radio dating is not accurate. For example, Mount St. Helens erupted in 1981. In 1993, 12 years after the eruption, rocks from the lava dome were radiodated. The result? These rocks were determined to have an isochron radio date of over 1 million years old. That's a big swing and a miss!
The movie The Lord of the Rings featured Mount Naga'aroho in New Zealand as Mount Doom. It last erupted in the 1970s, and isochron radio dating determined that those 60-year-old rocks were between 270,000 and 3.9 billion years old. That's quite a range, and not even close to the true age of those rocks. Another swing and a miss! Sidney P. Clementson studied volcanic rocks in Russia from a variety of sources and compared these recently formed rocks with Soviet uranium dating tests of the same volcanic rocks. He found that in every case, the uranium lead ages were tens of millions of years older than the true ages. Ages ranged from 50 million to 14.6 billion years. Swing and a miss! Strike three! Not only are new rocks dated incorrectly using radio dating methods, the various types of radio dating give widely varying ages for the same rocks. For example, rocks from the moon were dated. Now, these rocks should have been about the same age as the Earth. The same rocks, measured with various radio dating methods, had ages from 2 million to 28 billion years old, depending on which method was used. You can't even get a consistent answer from radio dating methods. The problem is that the accuracy of radio dating is affected by what the rock has been exposed to. The pressure, the temperature, electric fields, magnetic fields, stress in the monomolecular layers, unknown initial conditions, unknown leaching, and many other factors. So how do geologists get dates for rocks? Essentially, they take the range of dates they get from radio dating and pick the one they think is the right date in order for it to fit with the theory of evolution. Are there other ways to date rocks? Yes, many other ways. Dating methods such as helium dating and fission track dating show the rocks to be very young. But you don't hear about those dates because they don't fit with the theory of evolution, so they are ignored. Radio dating is presented as rock solid, when in reality it is unreliable, highly variable, and other dating methods show the Earth to be very young, thousands, not billions of years old. I mean, I think that the age of the Earth is approximately, uh, probably 450 million years ago, but I, I, I do believe in the Big Bang Theory, that you know, what's the popular view that's held in the, in the, in the scientific view? the Earth is? Uh, probably at least four to 6,000 years old. Well, let me see. This is the year 2009. Mm -hmm. I believe that. I don't believe it's millions of years old. I believe that uh, God's the one who created it, and, and that's the, the, he, he's the one who knows how old it is. Yeah. What about fossils buried under many layers of sediment? Doesn't it take millions of years for all that sediment to build up? For example, in the Grand Canyon, we see layers of sediment a mile thick. It must have taken hundreds of millions of years for all those layers to build up. Right? When scientists looked at the Grand Canyon and saw all the layers of rock there, what they saw was a process that took tens of millions of years. But all that changed on May 18, 1980, when Mount St. Helens erupted we started to learn some new things about how quickly layers of sediment could accumulate. It doesn't take millions of years to build up thick layers of sediment. What it takes is a major catastrophic event. Mount St. Helens really was not a very big event. A global worldwide flood was and could easily have built up all the layers we see in the Grand Canyon over a very short period of time. Well, what about fossils? It takes millions of years for a fossil to form, right? Wrong. Here's a picture of a fossilized hat. Fossilization does not have to take very long. It depends on the conditions, and the conditions resulting from a worldwide flood would be right for rapid fossilization. In fact, if an animal does not fossilize rapidly, it's going to decay away and be gone and there'll be nothing left to fossilize. But scientists say that some fossils are hundreds of millions of years old, so they must be right, aren't they? After all, they are scientists. Wrong again. First, 
there is no way to directly measure the age of fossils. For example, radio dating does not work on fossils. Well, what about dating the rocks the fossils are found in? Nope, you can't do that either. Radio dating does not work on sedimentary rocks. But here's how they do it. Evolutionary scientists say that you can tell the age of the sedimentary rocks based on the index fossils included in those rocks. Index fossils are small marine fossils that have ages assigned to them. So if you find a sedimentary layer with an index fossil, you can assign the same age to that sedimentary layer and all the other fossils it includes. So now, how are index fossils dated? Well, they are dated based on evolutionary theory. In other words, the ages for index fossils were picked over 100 years ago, so they matched what the age was thought to be based on the hypothesis that evolution is true. Here's a quote from Radney Wong. The dating of each stratum and all the fossils in it is supposedly based on index fossils, when it is actually based on evolutionary speculations and nothing more. This means that fossils and rocks are dated by the theory of evolution, and the theory of evolution is proven by the dates given to the fossils and the rocks. That's uh, circular reasoning. That's determining the answer you want to get, and then using that answer to prove your answer right. Well, here, here's another quote. The intelligent layman has long suspected circular reasoning in the use of rocks to date fossils, and fossils to date rocks. The geologist has never bothered to think of a good reply, feeling the explanations are not worth the trouble as long as the work brings results. Are authorities maintaining, on the one hand, that evolution is documented by geology, and on the other hand, that geology is documented by evolution? Isn't that a circular argument? A circular argument arises. Interpret the fossil record in terms of a particular theory of evolution, inspect the interpretation, and note that it confirms the theory. Well, it would, wouldn't it? It was Noah's flood that created all of the deep sediment that is found all over the Earth. The evidence we observe matches perfectly what we'd expect to see as the result of a worldwide flood. It does not match what we'd expect to see from the slow processes of evolution over long periods of time. How old do you think the Earth is? About 6,000 years. And why do you say that? Well, all the evidence seems to indicate that it's a young Earth rather than an old Earth. How old do you think the Earth is? Somewhere between 6,000 and 10,000 years. Uh, I've looked through the Bible chronologically. If you take it literally, it's going to show you um, different dates, different ages, and you can back it up and get to about that answer. Could you tell us how old you think the Earth is? About 6,000 years. Uh, about 6,000 years old. A little over 6,000 years. Okay, but what about starlight? We can see stars and galaxies that are tens and hundreds of millions of light years away. That means it took the light tens and hundreds of millions of years to get to Earth. So the universe cannot be just a few thousand years old. It must be billions of years old. Right? Wrong. You've only heard one side of the story, the theory about everything coming from the Big Bang. But is that the only possibility? These are some of Einstein's equations of general relativity. And if we make some basic assumptions, they will tell us about what the early universe looked like. For example, if we assume that the universe is unbounded, meaning that it's infinite, it has no boundaries, and we put those assumptions into these equations, what we get is the Big Bang. On the other hand, some recent evidence is showing that the universe is bounded, that it has a size to it, that it's not infinite. And if we put that assumption into these equations, what we get is the universe coming out of a white hole. And that has something very unique happening. What that means is we have an effect called gravitational time dilation. And that means that time has passed at a different rate in different parts of the universe. For example, we can have a galaxy that is 10 million light years away, and a clock in that universe will show the light taking 10 million years to get to the Earth. But on the other hand, a clock here on Earth 
will show that just 6,000 years passed. There are also other theories about the origin of the universe that fit a young Earth and light reaching us from distant galaxies hundreds of millions of light years away. Oh, and by the way, the Big Bang Theory has many holes and problems of its own. It's not the solid wall of fact presented in the textbooks. For example, based on the laws of physics, gas clouds cannot condense into stars and planets as the Big Bang Theory states. Gas does not clump together. Plus, there would not have been enough time for enough gas from the Big Bang to get to the edges of the universe where we already see fully formed mature galaxies. How objects rotate is another problem. Objects thrown out by an explosion should all have the same angular momentum, meaning they all should rotate in the same direction. But planets, stars, solar systems, and galaxies rotate in many different directions, making the Big Bang totally impossible. But not only do some galaxies rotate the wrong way, most galaxies shouldn't even exist. They should have fallen apart structurally hundreds of millions of years ago. They are not in a shape that can be sustained by a rotating collection of objects. It's impossible. Here's a quote from James Treffill. The problem of explaining the existence of the galaxies has proved to be one of the thorniest in cosmology. By all rights, they just shouldn't be there. Yet, there they sit. It's hard to convey the depth of frustration that this simple fact induces among scientists. The evidence against the Big Bang and that everything was formed by chance billions of years ago goes on and on and on. Here's some more quotes. A scientific study of the universe has suggested a conclusion which may be summed up in the statement that the universe appears to have been designed by a pure mathematician. Sir James Jeans. Oh, by the way, saying something must have been designed means there must have been a designer to design it. Here's another quote. One could perhaps describe the situation by saying that God is a mathematician of a very high order, and he used very advanced mathematics in constructing the universe. Oh, and by the way, that's from Scientific American. In such a short video as this, we can just barely touch the surface of this subject. Here's a textbook with over 1,000 pages of science and quotations that show evolution is false and God created the Earth about 6,000 years ago. Yet this thick textbook still only covers a small part of the evidence that's available. Let's review what we've covered. Based on adding up the ages in the genealogies in the Bible, we see that the Bible says the universe is about 6,000 years old. Then if we look at what we'd expect to see if the earth was billions of years old versus what we'd expect to see if the earth was a few thousand years old, we find that the amount of dust on the moon supports a young earth. The existence of comets supports a young earth. Dating methods such as helium dating and fission tracks support a young Earth, while radio dating has proven to be inaccurate and unreliable. With the eruption of Mount St. Helens, we learned that deep sediment, consisting of many layers, can be deposited in a very short time. Fossils don't take a long time to form. There are other theories that explain how light from distant stars got to Earth in just 6,000 years as measured on the Earth. Here's the answer to the question I asked at the beginning. These dinosaur tracks are not millions of years old. They are about 4,500 years old. They date from the time of Noah's flood. Unlike what you hear in the news and in most textbooks, the evidence supporting a universe that is billions of years old is very lightweight. In reality, both the Bible and the weight of the evidence show the Earth to be very young, about 6,000 years old. How old do you think the Earth is? Well, I think it's uh, around 6,000 years, probably six to 10,000 years, but... 
the age of the rocks show us. When we look at the fossils, we see that uh, they were uh, laid down rapidly instead of in long periods of time. How old do you think the Earth is? Oh, about 6,000 years. Why do you say that? Oh, well, there's a lot of evidence of a young How Earth. How old do you think the Earth is? Uh, 6,000. How old do you think the Earth is? 6,002. Here is the key question. Why do scientists, geologists, paleontologists, biologists, some really smart people who are honestly seeking the truth, why don't they see the plain evidence that shows we live in a universe created exactly as described in the Bible? Well, the Bible gives us the answer. John 3.19 says, Men loved darkness rather than light. In our natural state, we reject God. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. People turn away from the truth of the earth being created by God about 6,000 years ago, not because the evidence rejects a young earth and supports an earth billions of years old, but because they are rejecting God. If you start with a view of reality that rejects the God of the Bible, then the conclusions you must arrive at must support that rejection of God. The problem is not that science has proven the earth to be very young or very old. The problem is that people come to a conclusion based on what they want to believe before they have even heard the evidence. Now, yes, there are many Bible-believing Christians who believe the earth is billions of years old. I used to believe in evolution, and I thought that I just didn't understand the Bible well enough to see how evolution fit into the Bible. The problem is that we are totally immersed in a culture that only talks about evolution being true. We don't get both sides of the story. We never hear all the evidence. So we assume what we're hearing is true because it's the only story we're hearing. As a result, we use worldly wisdom to interpret God's word instead of using God's word to help us understand the world. Now, if you're a Christian who believes in evolution, that does not mean you're not saved. But I ask you to consider the source of your belief in evolution. Are you trusting God, the creator of the universe, the eyewitness who was there when everything was created? Or are you trusting in science that is based on circular reasoning? So why don't people trust God? Why can't they even see the evidence? Well, it's because before you can trust God concerning creation, you must know you are disobeying God and then be trusting God as your Savior. So what's that all about? Being saved from what? I don't need saving. I'm doing just fine. I'm a good person. I'll go to heaven. All good people go to heaven, right? So how, how does somebody get to heaven? I think... Um my understanding is yeah. that your deeds directly lead you to uh, go to heaven or hell. So basically, good deeds lead you to good places mm -hmm. and bad deeds lead you to bad places. You consider yourself to be a good person. I do. And I take pride in that. Yeah, I think I'm a good person. Dogs love me anyway. The problem is, you're not a good person. And what you need saving from is God. You have broken God's laws. And when you die, you'll face God's justice his correct and fair punishment for your breaking his laws. Have you broken God's laws? Remember, you have been created in the image of God, and the standard you must meet is perfection. For example, have you ever used God's name in a wrong way, maybe as a cuss word or to express surprise? That's taking the name of the one who has given you everything, including the air that you breathe, and using it as a filth word. That's called blasphemy. Have you ever told a lie? You guys, how many lies have you told? A lot. Uh, millions, lot. I couldn't lot. even count. Okay. You're normal people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how many lies have you told? Lies? Lies. Yeah. More than I could count, More I guess. You... Have you ever taken something that does not belong to you, even if it's something small, maybe downloading music off the internet? That's called stealing. But many people say, I've never murdered anyone. Have you ever murdered anybody? No. No. <laughs> have you ever murdered anybody? Yes, every yeah, day. Yeah, you have. No, every day. No, okay. no. I have. I will admit it. I've murdered somebody. Under God's definition of murder. 
because Jesus said that if you are really angry at somebody, you have committed murder in your heart. Like if you're driving in traffic and you flip somebody off because they cut you off. <laughs> okay, then I've, I have killed people. Yes, I bring up, every I bring day. up that example every because... Every day. Yeah, I, <laughs> in Matthew 5.22, Jesus says, But I say to you, that whomsoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whoever shall say, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. God looks at your thoughts and sees anger to be the same as murder. And it's the same with adultery. If you look at another person other than your spouse with lust, God sees what you're thinking and knows you are committing adultery in your mind. These are just five of the Ten Commandments. If you've broken any one, it's the same as breaking them all. James 2.10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. You have broken God's law and deserve God's justice. The book of Romans chapter 3 verse 23 tells us that everyone has broken God's law. Everyone. Me. You. Everyone! That means we have all earned the penalty for breaking God's law, eternity in hell. God is just, and that means the penalty must be paid. He can't just let you go free. Just think, if there was a county, state, or federal court with a judge who let every criminal who came into his courtroom go free, would they be considered a good judge? Of course not. But some people say, well, I didn't really do anything serious. How can God send me to hell for downloading music from the internet or just telling one small lie that didn't hurt anyone? Your offenses against other people may be small, but your offense against an infinite God is infinite. Consider this. If I tell a lie to one of my small children, what are the consequences? Well, nothing really. But... What if I tell a small lie to my wife? The consequences can be significant. And if I tell a lie to a grand jury, the consequences can include some jail time. The severity of the offense depends on the authority of the one offended. And God is the ultimate authority and is infinite in all respects, meaning the offense is infinite and the just punishment is infinite. So it looks like we're all headed to hell. We've all broken God's laws. We have all earned his just and infinite punishment. And there's nothing I can do to save myself from this. And because I must pay my own infinite penalty, there's nothing I can do to help you pay your penalty. We're both doomed. Unless we can find someone who has never broken God's laws and who is willing to step in and take our punishment on himself. There's only one person who can do that. God himself. And God did do this for us. God came to earth. He died on the cross 2,000 years ago, taking on himself God's full wrath for every one of God's laws you have broken. And he gives this to you as a free gift. He did this for you because he loves you so much. He died so that you can live for eternity. Then he rose from the dead on the third day, demonstrating what he promised is true. There is life after death for those who trust that Jesus died to pay the penalty they have earned for breaking God's laws. Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Do you believe that Jesus Christ paid the penalty you owe for breaking God's laws? Are you trusting Jesus to save you from God's punishment? John 20, 31 says, But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. John eleven twenty five 25 says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die.
God will tell you. I sent a man to rescue you, he and will. you're a fool to say no. <laughs> you're right. That's you're, that's what God will say, exactly. and He's going to say, when we die, you we'll can. be judged. And God's going to say, you broke my laws. I sent Jesus to rescue you, and then you said no. And I last, said no. Exactly.